welcome back to Settlement Nation podcast. Thank you for tuning in once again for another fantastic episode with me, Courtney Barber, and my guest for today, Ryan McKean, trial lawyer and CEO of the Connecticut Trial Firm. Not only is Ryan a speaker, a published author, and an Inc. 5000 honoree, which showcases noteworthy, noteworthy cases of company growth and development, he also had the highest verdict in the state, $100 million, after a $1.5 million offer, and his client was paralyzed when 1,300 pounds of unsecured light bulbs fell on him from 20 feet above, which just sounds absolutely terrible. We are going to talk about that today. But what we're really going to focus on today is the business of law for solos and small to medium-sized firms. Everything from formation to scalability, systems, cash flow, identifying important tasks, and how to get more cases in the door. This is a must listen for those running or considering starting their own practice. So welcome, Ryan. Well, Courtney, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Oh, well, I am really excited, Ryan, because I am a big entrepreneur from the past. I love anything to do with business. And the fact that you really focus on business excites me. For everyone who doesn't know, I actually heard Ryan speak at a recent uh, financial planning conference. And he had one of the best presentations of the whole thing because he actually spoke about actionable items that not only financial planners, but you know, lawyers can actually take to help and grow their businesses. So I'm very excited to dive in. But I want to start off First, I read in your bio, which I find really fascinating, you had a different experience to many attorneys starting out. You were actually hurt in a car accident and then experienced being on that side of the way that insurance companies treat people who've been injured. Let's begin by talking about that experience. Yeah, yeah, I think it, uh, you know, looking back, it changed my life in a a way that I just didn't understand it at the time. Um, and, and I mean, the basics of it are, look, I, I worked, I've worked every day since I was about 12 years old delivering papers and I saved up all my money for uh, a car. I got a 1986 Honda Accord LXI and, um, I'm driving with my girlfriend who's now my wife. Um, and, um, uh, her brother, now my brother-in-law who's in the back seat. And, you know, we got, we got T-boned, we got hurt. Um, you know, my car was totaled and, you know, I saw the, you know, our first response was like, oh, we don't need a lawyer. But then it was like, Hey, I'm in, I'm in pain. And, um, I saw what the insurance company put me through because I didn't have like access to, to treatment because I was going away to college. Um, and you know, really the pain that I still feel, uh, to this day. And, you know, I felt like they called me a, a liar, um, that, you know, me or my case was not worth very much. Um, and, you know, we did get a lawyer, we did fight back. Um, and I think that sort of like started my uh, real interest in sort of being able to use the law to help people um, who are going through uh, something traumatic. Um, and yeah, that's, 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 that's my origin story of becoming a trial lawyer. Which is kind of interesting because I think a lot of people don't, even though they're very plain of focused and they love fighting for um, their clients, they don't have that experience off the bat. So it's very interesting that that's how it started for you. But I kind of want to just throw you in. This is a question that I did ask both Nick, who I know that you're a fan, and Keith Mitnick. Um, Other than hard work, Ryan, what has been the recipe for getting where you are today? (laughs) <laughs> learning from people like Nick and, and Keith Mitnick and, uh, and, and, uh, Don Keenan and Rick Friedman and Randy McGinn and, and, and David Ball and learning from the legends of, you know, people who, who do this work. And early on, my partner, Andrew Garza and I, we didn't have any money or much money at all. And we wanted to be those people. Like we wanted to, we, like we were wannabes. Um, and so we showed up at their events. We listened to what they had to say and we had the courage. Um, you know, part of it was that, you know, when we were getting in big cases, you know, you as a smaller lawyer can do one of two things. You can refer them out or you can handle them. And we said, you know what? We want to be the Nick Rowleys of the world. We want to handle these cases. And and what we what we believed was that, you know, what we saw from all these people that we learned from was that trial lawyers come in all shapes and sizes. Like nobody is born a great trial lawyer. It is something that you can learn. It is something that can be taught. 
It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of experience. Um, but there are people out there who you can you can teach from, you can learn from. And I think reading all those books, going to all their seminars, going to those workshops, learning how to do focus groups, like that made all the difference to us um, because you know it was our it was our belief that there were that there was no like magic to it like it was mm -hmm. much more science than art i love that you know and speaking of that with your partner who also helps you run the firm you have over 25 stuff from your website um you know that ranges from other trial attorneys to executives intake specialists you've got client managers two locations but you also cover all of connecticut how did you begin with thinking, you know, not only do I want to be a trial lawyer, but I want to be a business owner and then scale up your practice to where it is today? Well, what what really happened was we we knew that if like we knew for us that w the only way we could do great trial work was to have a great business. And actually, right now, we're like there's people not on our website. There's like 30, there's like 35 of us <laughs> right. at the moment um, and, and, and growing. Um, um so, so, you know, we, we realized that we needed a business to, su to support our dreams of doing great trial work. Um, because if you, if you didn't have your sort of, you know, to me, the enemy, you know, the great enemy of the trial lawyer is disorganization. And if you're disorganized in your case and you're disorganized in your business, like it takes up t valuable time and energy into doing what is important. Um, so we said, look, we want to be both fantastic at the trial work and we also want to be both fantastic at the business side of it because those two things um, are, are not exclusive. Like they, 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 they complement each other. Um, and so what we did is we, you know, we set out a, a, a vision uh, for us, which was, you know, we didn't have a case worth $100,000 really looking. And we said, we want to be the best trial firm in Connecticut. And we said, you know what, in order to do that, we need a, we want to get a $10 million jury verdict. Like that was our sort of obscene goal at the time. And, you know, in order to do that, like, you, well, you know what, you need to build a team to do that. You need to get financial things in order. You need to get the case in the door. You need to sign up the case. You need to process the case. Um, and you need to stay alive because when you get a huge case in, um, you know, you can go broke trying to get it to verdict. Um, right. So all of those things, you know, came into clear focus of we want to be excellent in the courtroom, excellent in business because because they're 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 really one in the same thing. You're so right. Actually, one of our most popular episodes um, going back, it was last year. It was actually business growth with Bob Simon, who's a big attorney out of California, because I think, you know, a lot of our listeners, they're, they're solos, they're business owners. And that's a lot of the questions I get asked the most is they want to know how to go out on their own, you know, leave a big firm and start their own business. They don't know how much money they should start with, when to hire people, how to set it up and what's most important to focus on. And what I really liked is you did a post recently for everyone who doesn't follow Ryan on LinkedIn. We're going to have his LinkedIn at the bottom of the episode in the show notes because he puts so many gems out there that he should be charging for. And they're all free. This great advice. But one of them was um, how to scale a law firm with not much money. And you said there are four things that people should be writing down at the beginning of the week to really focus on. So I want to go through each of those four things. I'll read them out. And I would love if you could elaborate for the listeners because they maybe have not seen this great post. Um, and the first one that you had was, how am I going to make money this week? Yeah, um, because look, I mean, I, I started my law firm with $2,500. Like I don't come for money. We never even in this firm, we never borrowed money to get to where we wanted to be. So we, we didn't have any cushion. Um, you know, uh, uh, my wife was uh, at the time, you know, uh, she was home with the kids. So it was like all all my income. So, I, I you know, the, the financial pressures are, are, are acute. And the reason I say like, well, how are you going to get money this week? It's like you can't delay that. Like you can't ignore that because if you don't have money, you can't pay your rent. You can't pay your experts. You can't pay your malpractice. You can't pay your mortgage. And that puts immense pressure on you. Um, so you need to look at those things that like, well, okay, how am I going to make a thousand or two thousand dollars this week just to stay to, to stay afloat um, and not ignore them? 
um, uh, because you you constantly um, you need some you need to figure out cash flow and you need to have cash um, and you need to keep it coming in. Um, so that's why I, I phrase the question, what am I going to do this week? Because a lot of times with solos or small firms, there could be a tendency of like, well, hey, you know what, I've got a bigger case and, you know, it'll settle maybe next month and we've got a mediation and maybe that'll be a $30,000 fee. Okay, but then that mediation gets continued. Something changes in that case. Um, and then you have a credit card bill and rent due. So it's like, what am I going to do this week to get some money in the door in my pocket? And that's great because I think exactly as you said, a lot of people, they have ideas of what they think might come in the future. But if that doesn't happen, you know, we know a lot of things get continued or moved. You can really put yourself in a very stressful situation, um, which leads to the second point that you had, which is what files will pay me more in the future? Yeah, I mean, and, and so, I mean, look, in any any practice, whether your personal injury or, you know, I mean, real estate divorce or whatever, you have, you, you probably have a mix of cases. Um, so you have cases that, that are, that are sort of bigger and bigger cases. And so if you're working on all the things of, well, I need to get paid this week, you can be back the case that's really going to make your profit for the year. And so you want to be working on some longer term, higher value projects, even a little bit every single week, because Really, like that's what's going to make the difference between you at the end of the year having profit and having not. Um, and so when we got our paralysis case in, you know, one of the things that we did was we're like, OK, we, we need to try to isolate this case because we need to be constantly working on it because this case is an absolute difference maker for our client, for our firm, uh, for our future. And we need to create the space to work on that case and work on it every single week. Um, because the sooner we can move it, the better it is for our client. And ultimately, the better it is for, for the firm as well. That's fantastic. Now, the next one is, what can I stop doing? Why is this important for people to figure out what they should not be doing? Because the the great trick in all of this and it's 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 sort of a hard switch to flip and it was really hard for for us um which is that the at least for me the instinct was always just grind harder grind 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 um but you can grind yourself down um and also you can do a lot of work that you 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 in fact shouldn't be doing that's robbing you from doing higher value work so i mean i started as a doing my books being my janitor doing my marketing answering my phones doing the trial like every single job in this firm I have, I have had. And, um, but you know, we only get, you know, so many hours in a day, so many hours in a week. Um, and if you're doing work that could be done by somebody else at a lower rate, you're actually robbing your ceiling of money. Yeah. You look at it on a cash flow basis and you're like, well, my expenses are low, but yeah, your top line number is also going to be low mm. because you are constantly robbing your business and robbing yourself of cash. And uh, it shows up and you're going to hit a hard ceiling if you're not downwardly delegating some of that work. That is fantastic. I'm loving all of these. I'm learning a lot. So I hope everyone is listening very intently. The last one on your list, which was really important, I think this is how you get cases in the door. You know, you had write down one to two things that you're going to be doing this week to market your law firm. Yeah, I, you know, and in, in, in this was uh, taught to me at one of the trial seminars, you know, the, the best lawyers have the best cases. Um, and it's 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 a chicken and an egg thing. <laughs> like it, it like it, it it absolutely it absolutely is um so um you know how are you going to go out there and generate the cases that you're going to need to make your career and you need to be thinking about that too many lawyers um you know no nike doesn't say like hey we're going to market when sales are low OK, they're like, we have a constant marketing plan. We've been marketing for 50 years and we're going to keep going um, and, and developing our marketing. And that's the way law firms have to think about it. Um, they have to think about constantly like that is a core function of any business. It needs to be a core function of your firm, because, yeah, if you're going to be, you know, Nick Rowley or that's what you want to be, you've got to get cases that are like Nick Rowley level. Um, if you're trying you know, rear end missed car accident cases and getting good results. Like that's, that's amazing. Like we have plenty of those, but you know, for us now, it's like, we've moved on to, you know, taking on gun manufacturers and, and, and mm -hmm. things like that. 
that happen when you get out there and build a name for yourself. And from your experience, Ryan, what are some great ways that, you know, solo, small business, small firm owners can market themselves if they don't have a ton of cash to begin with? The, the you know, the dirty secret, not so secret in this business is all your best cases are going to come from referrals, all of them. Um, and so referral based marketing, especially for injury firms, is is very, very important. Um, and, you know, you can generate referrals uh, a lot of ways, you know, one of which one of the ways that we generated referrals was by engaging in national uh, networks and people would say, hey, oh, you're, you're Connecticut. That's actually why we named ourselves Connecticut Trial Firm. So people would say, hey, oh, OK, oh, it got a Connecticut case. We'll send it to, to Ryan and Andrew. Um, so that that's sort of an important part of it. And how do you network? Yeah, you go to you know, the trial colleges, you go to the, to the, to the workshops, um, you get on the listservs, you contribute, you add value, you listen, um, you, you post on LinkedIn about what you're doing. That's a great way to connect with people. And, you know, basically people need to, all they need to do is know, like, and trust. Um, and so look, if they don't know you, they can't hire you. So you have to be known. Um, if they don't, like you, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a problem you probably can't fix. Um, but, but they're going to trust you if you're actually engaging in the stuff, if you're showing up at those workshops, if you're putting the effort in, if you're running focus groups, um, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're walking the walk, um, and, and again, like the great thing about that I found about even like the legends of the, the trial bar are like, they are, to a person generous and they are to a person teachers like they're great teachers like talk to them like go up to nick rowley after the seminar talk to him and he definitely is a nice person and he will talk back which is great um speaking of you know linkedin and social media platforms ryan you know, how have you been using these to your advantage? Because obviously it worked. I read your posts now. Um, but how do you think uh, other lawyers can kind of use these to help them grow their their message, their firm? Yeah, I, I think that the biggest thing, Courtney, is you you want to, with any post, try to add value to somebody in, 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 in some which way. And it could be just a little bit of value, um, you know, you know, just just share what it is that you have known, share your journey. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, the barrier of writing something is they go, oh, it's not interesting or it's not this. And chances are like, look, there are 8 billion people on this planet. If it is interesting to you, it's probably interesting to at least several hundred million people. <laughs> Okay, like big, big planet, lots of people. Um, so what you should be doing is sharing your insight, sharing your struggle, being honest about it. Um, you know, and, and, and look, the great trial lawyers, like they, they do this all the time. They will talk about their losses. They will talk about their wins, things that worked, things that didn't. And and they will try to use their experience to help make somebody else better by sharing whatever it is that they have to share that day. So yeah, show up and try to add value. Like it's not, it's really not rocket science. Mm -hmm. No, that's so true. Um, let's switch gears a little bit to talking about if you already have a firm, say you're running your business, it's going okay, but you kind of want to get some insight into scale. Um, maybe let's talk about the vision. Like why is it important to have a vision of where you want your practice or your firm to go or what it wants to be known as? V vision is the most important component to this because you have to accept if you're a law firm owner that or a lawyer that growth is a choice. Like it is absolutely a choice. It does not happen by accident. Like firms like Morgan and Morgan just didn't happen by accident. Or even great trial lawyers um, like, you know, Rick Friedman or whoever, like that didn't happen by accident. Like they set out and they said, I want to do this. Um, because when you say, when you when I when I teach this, I'm always saying like it's it's no different than a vacation. And if you just say, Hey, look, I wanna have a I wanna have fun. Well, that that's sort of like meaningless and aspirational. But if you're like, I want to hike um, in Patagonia and OK, 
Like you can start budgeting for it. You can start saying, I need this kind of gear. I need this kind of plane ticket. Here's when to go. Here's who's going to go with me. Here's how I'm going to physically train for those hikes. Uh, here's how I'm, you know, you can start working backwards and then engineering it. But if you don't know where you want to go, like you're just going to float around. You're not going to get anywhere. So I think you need to be honest about what it is that you want to do. And I'm going to suggest that to anybody that our, our goal of building of a $10 million verdict is very different than if I said, well, I want to have a caseload of a thousand injury cases like that. That's a different firm. That's a different focus. And if I want a caseload of a thousand, maybe I don't spend money to go to uh, a trial institute or I don't care as much about focus groups in those things. And I care a lot more about marketing and churning files. Fine. But you have to know what it is that you want to do. And I would say that the very best people at business that I have come across, whether it's law, injury work, outside of law, they have the clearest visions of what they want for their firms, their futures, uh, and right. really themselves. Yeah, I love that. And I think vision is so important because you have to know where you're going and what wall to put your ladder on. Um, but you probably are a big proponent of systems. I can just tell but by the way that you run your firm and how you're all set up. Let's talk about building out systems next to something that's really important when you are running a business. Yeah, I mean, look, every every business has systems. Um, you can't operate in the world without systems. The question is whether or not you write them down. Um, and <laughs> it's the act of writing them down and making the videos and constantly creating and revising and not thinking about things as like a one-off thing. It's like, you know, there are systems for trial. There are systems for signing cases. There are systems for marketing. And they can always be improved. They can always be tweaked. But you have to have um, a culture of thinking about problems systemically um, mm -hmm. and thinking about opportunities systemically. Uh, so what we did is we created, um, before we even had an employee, we started creating a, a giant private Wikipedia that had all of our stuff. Uh, we use, you know, FileVine for case management systems that when it was just me and Andrew who started and we started building out the task flows that we wanted of how we wanted paralegals that we didn't have to work. Um, and so what you're trying to do is you're trying to set your team up for success. Um, and you're also buying yourself as an owner time. Uh, so that way, you know, you're not constantly in meetings uh, trying to convey knowledge that should otherwise be conveyed pretty easily. And on that one, you know, that point you just made about your team, You'd said to me before as like something that was really important to cover, which I absolutely love, which is about your culture. Did you set out to have a specific culture maybe when you started the Connecticut trial firm or how did you think about what you wanted it to feel like when people have an experience with you? Yeah, we, you know, culture is just in my, my definition of culture is just culture is what you do. And, you know, one of the things, Courtney, anybody who should take from me or this podcast is you have to be intentional about things. Like if you are if you are if you are intentional, like you can make anything happen. And if you are unintentional about it, like you are just drifting through life and things will happen to you. Um, so we wanted a culture of excellence. Uh, we wanted a culture that was very um, transparent, very compassionate, um, very team oriented. Um, and so we sought to create that culture, uh, teach that culture ingrain that culture, systematize that culture, reward that culture, and prune that culture if somebody was not a fit. Um, and mm -hmm. so that is something that we have created intentionally because all the vision, all the systems, like, you know, the people who say culture eats everything, like they are correct. And, um, you know, so you need to be intentional about what you want your work environment to to, to, to feel like what you want your people to do, what you want strive, what you want to be striving for. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I, I think you, you, once you start looking for those things and once you've established it, Courtney, the greatest thing that happens is people will seek you out. Like if your message is out there, they will say, I want to come work with you. Um, that is almost every hire we make right now, which is people who solicit mm -hmm. us. Because they're like, I see what you're doing. I, I I see you on social media. I see your results. I want to be a part of this team. I want to play for this team. That's what you want. Like that is to me the greatest sign of cultural success. I totally agree. And 
you know, was there an experience that you had maybe in the past of a company that you came in contact with or a service provider or someone that you looked at them and thought, wow, this is how I want to run my own firm? Or was this just your own making? Yeah. Oh, no. Geez, no. Um, there. I mean, there were so many examples of it. Um, you know, um, Apple was, was a giant um, influence of how we wanted to, you know, operate, which was sort of like, that's where we get sort of our tech forward, um, aggressive, excellent, uh, you know, striving, uh, sort of, we're going to make a dent in the world. I think DNA comes from, you know, modeling things off of, um, off of Apple. Um, you know, we try to model, um, our customer service, our client service off of, you know, businesses that do amazing things with client service, whether, whether it be the Ritz or Four Seasons or, um, you know, even on a, even on a much lower end, like something like Chick-fil-A, like where they, you know, they have a culture of like, we're going to, we're going to, you know, it's, it's a better experience than McDonald's, regardless of what some, someone may think about Chick-fil-A, <laughs> like, but that, that's, those are, those are sort of things that we, we looked for and, um, looked outside of legal. So anytime, like, look, the truth is anybody listening out there, they don't, they can't compare my law firm to somebody else's law firm. They most of the time don't need multiple law firms in their life for a specific issue. So your competition is Amazon. Your competition is Apple. Your competition is Starbucks. Um, that's where they're, that's where the consumer baseline is. I love that. And it's so true. You know, when you have a great experience, I think back in the day, I read a book and it said when Zappos started when they were maybe in Las Vegas, where they said you could call them about anything. And people used to call them and ask the customer service people random questions like they probably do now chat GPT or Google. They used to call them and ask them questions about different stuff. And the, the rule was you had to answer it. So I really like the fact that you've taken inspiration from other great companies. Uh, we have one last question just about business. And then we're going to switch a little bit to trial. What do you think has been your best return on investment for your firm or your practice so far? I'm going to go, I'm going to go two things. One, one of which is investing in going in learning from top flight trial lawyers. Like with, with, without a question, we approach cases way differently than our peers, way different than defense lawyers. And we're like, we're, we're going to get you. <laughs> um, and, and having the confidence and the training and the it, it, and understanding the science and, and, and art all behind all of it, like that is that is thing number one, like invest in yourself um, and also invest in business and learning those business skills. Um, so invest in your training, um, up level uh, your training. And really, the second thing is invest in your people. Um, invest in training for them. Invest in uh, making sure that they have good health care and good good salaries and a good work environment and their professional needs are being met. And frankly, like hire great lawyers to help support you in that. <laughs> hire lawyers who may be better than you at, say, writing um, or, 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 or different facets of the practice of law. Um, so invest in yourself and invest in your people. I love that. All right. So for everyone listening so far, I hope that you've gotten a lot of great information about your firm. Now we're going to switch a little bit to trial because I really want to dive into this $100 million verdict um, that you had, Ryan, with your attorney partners. Uh, you did say it was the highest verdict in the state. Is it? Is that still the highest? Yeah, it's, a, it's the highest bodily injury verdict, um, mm -hmm. the highest personal injury verdict. Um, our good friend, uh, Chris Maddy uh, took uh, Alex Jones for uh, on, on some of the Sandy Hook stuff for a week later for for more on sort of a defamation case. Um, that that's case is sort of uh, sort of different than ours, but we have sort of the highest bodily injury verdict. And sort of and prior to that, the highest verdict was was um, something like thirty six million. So we we, we mm -hmm. like we like three almost three times that um, in 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 this case. Um, wow. Uh, um, I, so go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah, I really want to talk about just a little bit of information, a backstory about this case. You know, how did it find its way to you? It it, it found its way to me from a criminal defense lawyer that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I had shared my vision for my firm with him. And he knew that Andrew and I were going to trial school and doing these things. And we really wanted to build, uh, you know, a, a, a top level trial practice like that. That was our goal. And he knew we were diligent about it. Like we weren't we weren't messing around. Um, and he had given tickets to a minor league hockey game uh, just out to 
out to like the, basically the public. And so he goes to this minor league hockey game. It's a preseason minor league hockey game. And um, a guy comes up to him and he says, look, I, you know, oh, you're, are you a lawyer? And he says, yeah. And he's like, well, I need a, I need a lawyer. My brother needs a lawyer. He's like, OK, what happened? And he said, my brother got paralyzed at work. And my and my friend said, you know, I don't I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I don't do this kind of thing. But I got two top guys for you. And then he connected uh, his brother with with us. Um, and then we all went out, met with him almost like the next day. Um, and then we started working on that case from there. Um, so back to the my point is like your best cases are going to come within network. And for our listeners, do you want to give a little bit of a uh, backstory about what this case is about and actually what happened to your client? <laughs> this is a case about a multi-billion dollar inter national company, Philips North America, Philips Signify, uh, wanting to save $5 in five minutes on a product uh, that was essential to their quarterly profits. And so what happened is they had um, they had these uh, TLED light bulbs um, that 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 were, they come in from China. Um, they come in wrapped as a as a unit in China with a slip sheet on the bottom. Um, and these products in 2017 were were very hot because they they didn't need to re- you didn't need to retrofit fixtures to get like the energy efficiency. And so these were Philips's top selling products. So they got them in from China wrapped with a, with a slip sheet. And what they did is they threw it on top of a pallet. Um, and they what they had to do was they had to spend the five minutes and five bucks, cut the slip sheet off and then unitize it, wrap the wrap the the the, the load of lamps to the pallet. So it's all one. So it all moves as one. They don't do that. They stick it on a pallet. They ship it off to um, our clients. Uh, our client works at a, a at a distributor, um, Rexel, um, which is a major distributor of light bulb, light light bulbs, and they sell light bulbs to electricians and all, all sorts of things. And so they they ship it right out. Um, and what happens is Rexel gets the package in. They put it up on a, on a rack about twenty feet high, and it sits there. Uh, that comes in on a Thursday, um, and on a Tuesday, my client is going to pick an order, um, and he's you know he's working for a customer, and, and somebody on a, a, a temporary worker on an adjacent aisle goes to try to lift up a pallet uh, to get to get something down, and it and it it it, it clips the 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 lamps that Phillips didn't wrap a little bit, lifts it a little bit, and it, the slip sheet causes it to just fall onto my client about 20 feet high, about 1,300 uh, pounds of lamps, uh, rendering him uh, paralyzed from uh, the the navel down. Oh, my gosh. That is just horrendous. Um, You know, what does it take and how much time did it take to work this case up? It, It took us five years. Um, and it took everything. It took everything of 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 five years to really work this up. It got a little bit delayed because of of COVID. Uh, we filed the case in early 2018, March of 2018. It ended up at trial in uh, September, October of uh, 2022. Um, and it took uh, something like 40 plus depositions, multiple site inspections, uh, you know, a dozen or so experts, uh, animations. It took it took everything to make to make this thing happen. Um, and, um, a lot of diligence was, you know, done. My partner is a incredibly detail oriented person who loves to live in the weeds. And he just lived in those weeds of packaging slips and, uh, (laughs) packaging regulations and a whole host of other things. Um, and, and really was able to put together, you know, a strong case, strong factual case against them. And what was going through your mind when the jury was out deliberating? Um, you know, what, what was going, what was going through my mind is, I mean, we, we felt that it went in well, um, and we had, we had jury, um, watchers who were in the courtroom who were, you know, watching the jury for us. Um, the marshal was like, you know, you guys are going to, this is going to be a huge verdict. Um, so we, we were feeling really, uh, we were feeling really good about it. Um, but you know, any trial lawyer who has been there that you, you don't know until you know, um, and so we got a knock on the door pretty early and they wanted to know what the life care plan was, what the amount of the life care plan was, which mm-hmm. was a great thing because they could only get there on the verdict form if they had found liability, which is which was right. basically our concern. And so they did. And, um, you know, then we got a knock on the door uh, a few hours later saying, OK, we have we have a verdict and they wa- they all walk in and uh, they, they hand over the verdict form to the clerk who hands it to the judge and the judge 
gets the verdict form, and he has like this complete poker face, complete poker face. Every judge in the courthouse, they knew this verdict was going to be big. They were sitting in the court uh, watching this. So we have a full courthouse, and he just gets it. And I start seeing him writing, and the judge is writing, and I'm like, he's making circles. I'm like, those are zeros. Like I'm like, oh, that is that is a lot of zeros that this man is writing. And so he he starts writing it down, and then the then he starts you know they, the clerk starts reading the verdict, and it says you know do you find that Phillips uh, signify adequately trained, and it was like yes we do, which was like we, we had three allegations of negligence: training, supervision, and um, just basically the uh, training supervision, and they basically didn't do it. So they they found four Phillips on the first one, and then they found on the second one that we were right, and they found on the third one that we were we were right. Um, and then they said, okay, economic damage is 15 million. And at that point, it's like, oh, that's a relief. And then they're like, non-economic damage is $75 million. And I just started sobbing. Like, I just like, I just sat there because it was such a, such a relief. And then they said, you know, loss of consortium damages, uh, $10 million. So it was a hundred million in that, in that way. Uh, and then there's still the question because there was multiple defendants, some of which were out of the case at this time. And they said, okay, it's 90% Phillips signifies fault for a verdict of 90 million against them, 100 million um, overall. And I just sat there absolutely sobbing um, because it, it, I, still, I still get choked up thinking about it today because we took on such a commitment for that client and we just we just wanted him to be safe. Like we wanted him to be taken care of and um, the jury got it. Um, so it's just, just tremendously emotionally powerful moment. Absolutely. I read in your LinkedIn post sort of a, a little bit about the case and how you said when the the verdict came back, the intense emotion that you felt and probably for your client as well. I, someone that I was speaking to once, they said they started crying and their client patted them on the back and said, it's OK, you did the best that you could. And they're like, no, it's a good, it's like happy tears. It's yeah. relief tears. <laughs> well, it's relief because, you know, look, what we do is serious work. It is like this man and his family trusted us with his future. And this was his one mm -hmm. shot. And this was right. the difference between him being able to feed his family and get what he, the medical care he needs and not. Uh, you know, this mm -hmm. was not me uh, being upset that they didn't pay for my car and things like that. This is this is big deal stuff. And, and right. um to, and, and again, like when you work so deeply with a family like that, like, um, you know, he likes to say that I, I, I gained uh, I gained a Puerto Rican family. Um, like I, I, I'm now me familia. Um, and you, you just you, you you really get to to work with people and know them and love them. And um, uh, so it just it's, it's just everything. That's amazing. What a great story. Um Let's transition a little bit. We only have a couple questions left. I mean, I always say time flies when you're having fun and talking to interesting people. So is there a case or, um, you know, a memorable moment in your career so far? And maybe it was something that you learned a great lesson from. There's a lot of people that have come on and, and their most memorable moment hasn't been maybe the, their best case or their biggest case, but something that really impacted them, even if it went wrong, but they learned a lot from it. Do you have a experience like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to punt on this one. And, 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 and the reason why is, I mean, we're big into this office culturally is like, we can't, we can't, um, we can't lose if we don't, if we learn. OK, we, we cannot lose if we learn. And so actually getting that verdict of one hundred million dollars was really built on the on the wins and losses of every single other trial that we had. Um, it was like, OK, why did we lose this trial? Why did we get a defense verdict? We got it. We took a defense verdict in a car accident case uh, probably about 10 months before. And it was like, well, you know what? We didn't really show the causation here. We didn't really tie that up. And so when we were doing uh, the cruise case, the $100 million case, we're like, we're going to tie up causation. And we hired animators because I want to show, even though I wanted to show the the boxes falling on him and how it snapped his spine, mm. which is different than just saying, well, the boxes fell on him and he, and he got he, he broke. I wanted to link those two things in the jurors' minds. Um, I mean, just 
I mean, really, like literally everything, uh, uh, you know, every trial is 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 a lesson. We we are big into doing like after action reports like the military does. What went right? What went wrong? What can we improve? Um, because there are there are lessons. And I would say getting that verdict was the result of years and, you know, probably about a dozen or so jury trials of wins and losses and good results and OK results and results we weren't happy with um, uh, built into that. So get out there and take those at bats. Get out there and take those (laughs) at bats. Anybody listening. And I think that's a really great point about doing a, you know, off to trial recap um, report sheet is actually because I think you have so much going on, you know, sometimes you're working multiple cases at once. It's really important to take the time to work, to write down what worked and what didn't, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, just so that you remember it later on when your mind's not in that's on something else and taking the action like you did, which obviously worked. Um, We're down to the last two questions. What is something you know now that you wish you knew 10 years ago, Ryan? I really, I really wish, um, like, look, I, I'm the first in my family to go to to go to go to college, graduate from a four year school, let alone law school. I work for a law firm that nobody knows for as an associate for six years. I start my firm with twenty five hundred dollars. I have a partnership that fails. Um, and and I, I, I think that the, the thing I really wish I, I, I knew was that it is so important to set the vision and it's so important to believe in yourself and to trust in if you're learning from the right people, whether it's the trial work or the business work, like trust what they're saying works, implement it, execute on it. And like, it can come true. So I I wish, you know, some of that doubt uh, that I lived with that sort of occupied headspace um, and weighed on me intensely. I wish I, 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 I could have, I could go back to myself and be like, Hey, everything works out in the end. Just everything works out in the end. Just do that. Listen, Work. And they always say, if it hasn't worked out yet, it's not the end. Um, last bit of advice for our listeners. What is one thing, if you could just leave them with one nugget of wisdom today from you, what would it be, whether it's for their firm, for themselves, believing in themselves, something? You know, I, I think that the, the biggest nugget I can, I, can, I, can, I can leave you with is like, look, there's, there's nothing non-replicable about what I've done or what um, my firm has done. Um, It's not easy. It's something that you have to learn. It's something you have to sacrifice for, have to be willing to put in the work, have to be humble about, um, have to invest in. But like there's, like 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 I said, I think the critical insight was like, you know what, there's like Nick Rowley's an amazing trial lawyer, but what he does, like, there's nothing magical about him. And I, I mean that in the, I mean that in the, as this deepest and most sincere compliment I can give because it is, it is learnable. It is teachable. And the real power that you have is in the execution of it. So, so most people, some people, they can go to, and they can, they can go to these seminars, they can read these books and they can say, Oh, that's a good idea. No, go out and do it. Get really, really good at that thing. And the opportunity will come and you will rise to the moment. That's, that's, if you take anything away from me, like, like, you know, it, it, your dreams are possible. I feel very inspired. I'm sure everyone, by the time people listen to this, they're going to, I mean, they need to have their cup of coffee and get their morning motivation from Ryan. If they want to, you know, co-counsel a case with you, work with you, buy one of your books. I know you have a, you're writing another book right now. Join your LinkedIn. This is the time to get all that information out. Plug yourself. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Ryan McKean on LinkedIn. Uh, you can, you know, if you're looking to co-counsel, you can send me a DM or whatever, uh, Twitter at Ryan McKean. Also, um, also a great place. You can email me Ryan at CT trial Um, you know, just, just don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm here, I'm here to help. Um, if I can add value, I, I, I will. Um, and you know, we always are looking for opportunities to, to help others and, 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 and grow and, you know, teach, teach what we've learned. Um, uh, you know, happy, happy to help. 
I love it. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on today. I know this is going to be a really top listen to episode. People love the business inside, your motivation, your stories. I think we may be having you back on again. I'm, I'm going to get that question, I'm sure, after this goes live. For everyone that listens to Settlement Nation, thank you so much for tuning in. Like, comment, and subscribe to your favorite trial lawyer podcast. If you love Ryan, send him some love. He is a great guy, and I'm sure he will, you know, put some more cool stuff on LinkedIn now that we're pushing it out there. But uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney.